Good morning. Welcome this morning to all as we gather to worship and praise our God. In this fourth Sunday in Advent, we see the wonderful reminder that since Adam, everyone is born with that sinful image of our first parents, and with that image, that thought, comes death. And yet we have also this morning the joy that God sent one, one born God and man to bring to us that new life that is there, to bring salvation then to every single generation. We pray that God prepare our hearts to greet our Savior. In our worship this morning, we begin with singing the invocation printed there on page three of our worship fold. <laughs> Dear friends, as we come to the end of another Advent season, we continue to turn our attention toward Bethlehem, the birthplace of our Savior. The prophet Micah prophesied in Micah 5, verse 2. Heavenly Father, in a most glorious yet humble way, you sent your son Jesus to be the son of Joseph and Mary. This son of God and son of man would one day be the holy sacrifice for the sins of all people. As we joyfully anticipate the celebration of Jesus' birthday. Strengthen our faith so that we see him, not only as a humble baby born in Bethlehem, but also as the divine conqueror of sin and Satan.
Please stand. We join together to confess our sins. Almighty God, our Creator and Redeemer, you alone are worthy of all praise and glory, but we often find ourselves living our lives that don't glorify you, even though we know better. Jealousy and anger fill our hearts much too often. Too often we're not content with the blessings you give us. For these and all our other sins, we show that we don't deserve your love, but instead your punishment. But every time we sin, lead us to remember that your Son shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to wash us and make us clean. Lead us to trust in him alone for our forgiveness and then to live our lives as your holy people, blameless in your sight because of Jesus. For these and all our other sins, we show that we don't deserve your love, but instead your punishment. I confess all my sins to you in humble and confident repentance. Please forgive me for Jesus' sake. Dear friends in Christ, our Savior God most certainly assures that though his gift of faith, our sins are removed as far as the east from the west. Our sins are forgiven through Jesus, we pray. Heavenly Father, we know that your Son shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to wash us and make us clean. Lead us to trust in him alone for our forgiveness and then strengthen us to live our lives as your holy people, blameless in your sight because of Jesus. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is from the Old Testament prophet Micah from the fifth chapter. He prophesies for us here a message of deliverance for the faithful. A king would be born. He would bring peace. Not just be a descendant of David, but could trace his roots back to Abraham, to Adam, and even before the creation of this world. This God-man who will rule more than just the clans of Judah, he's going to bring truth and justice to the very ends of the earth. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. So far, our first lesson. We now hear our praise choir singing, where shepherds lately knelt.
Thank you, praise choir. Our second scripture lesson this morning is from the letter to the Hebrews from the 10th chapter. The writer to the Hebrews here talks about sacrifice, the sacrifice that God made, the purpose of having a body, that one that God would send to make that sacrifice, so that by his body, we might be made holy once and for all. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. Though they were offered in accordance with the law, then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So far, our second lesson. We join in our next hymn, number 39. Now praise we Christ, the Holy One.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God for meditation this morning is from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. The rest of this text then is the song of Mary called the Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich empty away. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So far, God's word. We just read the song of Mary, also called the Magnificat, from the Latin, my soul magnifies the Lord. The Magnificat, it's looked at as one of the eight most ancient Christian hymns do you remember the first time that God promised to send Jesus? There was probably still bits of that forbidden fruit stuck in the teeth of Adam and Eve. God confronts Adam. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam responds, It's your fault, God. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Not exactly an apology, is it? And so God moves on to Eve. What is this you have done? And Eve's response, the devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me and I ate. It's like the only thing that they are sorry for is that they got caught. That rebelling against God, it turned out not exactly as well as they expected it. And now the only thing they're concerned about is passing the blame. So what does God do? He doesn't accept their excuses. Instead, he promises Jesus. The first promise of a Savior was directed at the devil himself. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Enmity, hostility. Moments earlier, Eve had gone over to Satan's side, but God now was taking her back. She's mine again. God says to the devil, because I'm going to send one of her offspring to do you in for good. And we look back from the New Testament perspective that we have, and with that we see Jesus on the cross. The devil strikes his heel, 
But in this, death is his victory. The devil's head is crushed. Sin is forgiven, and it's Jesus' resurrection that seals the deal. We can see crystal clear that this promise is fulfilled in Jesus. But even though without that luxury of hindsight, Adam and Eve believed this promise. The first sinners are the first Christians. God brings Adam and Eve back to himself. They believe the promise. An offspring of Eve will crush the devil's head. And then Eve has Cain. An offspring. Do you think that maybe she thought that this boy was the one? If she did, imagine her disappointment. And even if she didn't, imagine her pain. Her son has so much hate in his heart that he kills his brother Abel. And when God comes to him and asks what happened, it's like the only thing that he's sorry for is being caught. This rebelling against God, it didn't turn out as well as he expected it to. And now the only thing he's concerned about is passing the blame. Eve's pain isn't just that Cain was not the promised savior. Eve's pain isn't just the fact that Abel was dead. It's knowing that Cain got it from her. She and Adam had blazed that trail of rebellion against God there in the Garden of Eden. And now their children were going down that same path. It's called original sin. The hymn writer says, all mankind fell in Adam's sin. One common sin infects us all. What Adam and Eve turned into when they turned their backs on God and threw their arms around the devil has defined every single generation of their descendants. Sinners give birth to sinners. And now some 8,000 years later, we hardly think about that anymore. It's completely normal. When babies are born, we ooh and ah about how innocent they look. And we even call them little angels. Even though we know that as soon as they're able to express themselves, they're going to start proving us wrong. Normal. Mall and school shootings. Normal. At those times, we mourn the deaths. We pray for peace. But we also know without doubt that as long as the world does not end within the next month or two, there's going to be another one of them. It wipes away any notion that there is an insignificant sin. One bite of that forbidden fruit and look what happens. A spark that started a forest fire. Imagine Eve's heartache when she saw her offspring and what he did and to know that he got it from her. And now it was too late. She couldn't unlight that forest fire. It must have been worst for Adam and Eve because they had tasted perfection. They knew what it was like for God's will and man's will to be in that perfect harmony. And then they go on living 900 more years and see the world being filled with dozens of generations of their offspring. And their rebellion lives on in each one of them. The violence, the unbelief, proliferating until there are just eight Christians left. And God sends the flood to wipe the earth clean and start over again. 
but not even the flood could cleanse the world of sin because Noah and his family were infected with sin too. And it's the only world that we know and we call this world normal because we know what's going to happen when that angelic looking baby becomes a two year old. We see disrespectful children, disinterested parents, resentful spouses, crumbling homes, friendships that go sour impeccable role models who betray us. Does it get to you too? Even though we all know normal, it still wears on us. And, of course, there's also our own. Original sin isn't just something in everyone else that from the outside wears on us. We too were born that way. It corrupts us from the inside. There was a fine Christian man who was on trial for murdering his wife. His lawyers came to his pastor and asked if he would testify to this defendant's character that he was a fine Christian, incapable of doing such a thing. And the pastor told him that he couldn't say that because he believed that anyone was capable of anything. Can you see that in yourself? I wouldn't guess murder, but is there something else that you always thought was so reprehensible beyond your ability, but then you find yourself doing it and you rationalize it and you find someone else to blame for it and then your chief concern is no longer fleeing that sin but figuring out how not to get caught. It all started with Adam and Eve. It was passed on to Cain and Abel. It continued in every heart. It shows itself in every person's action from generation to the next. No exceptions. We can trace our sin back to Adam and Eve, but we cannot blame them. It's still our sin. We've lived up to our family name. How's that for the longest introduction to start talking about the Magnificat? Mary's song. I hope it was worth it. Because understanding what was on Mary's heart helps us understand so much better the words of her song. Some churches teach that Mary was different for us that God chose her to be the mother of the Savior because she was so innocent and so humble. Some even go so far as to say that she was an, an exception to original sin, that Jesus was sinless because his mother was. But no, Mary doesn't say, my soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God the Savior. No, she says, my Savior. As soon as she gets the message from the angel Gabriel, you will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Savior. That's what the name Jesus means. As soon as she gets the message, she hurries off to Elizabeth's house with those words still ringing in her ear, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When she tells Elizabeth the news, they are the two happiest people in the world. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Mary, the mother of God. And as she says, not just God the Savior, she says, God my Savior. To paraphrase her song, the reason that God picked me 
It wasn't because I was so great, but because I was the opposite. That's the way that God works. He hasn't given me what I deserve. He's given me what I don't deserve. And when the mighty one lifts up his arm to perform mighty deeds, it's not to bring down his fist on sinners who are crying out from the depths of things that are so horrible. They didn't even know they had it in them. It's not that he brings down his fist on them, but no, he raises his arm to lift them up. He's God, my Savior, Mary marvels. He's not forgotten. He's remembered the promises that he made. The promise made still when there are bits of that forbidden fruit stuck in the teeth of Adam and Eve. And all they were willing to do was offer excuses. God made a promise. He directed that promise directly to the devil. Her offspring will crush your head. Every generation since has offered God millions of reasons to forget that promise. And we have too. But God hasn't let go of his promise to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever to everyone who puts their trust in him from generation to generation. God's mercy isn't erratic. That mercy never skips a generation. It never falls short of what a sinner needs. God's mercy was there in the womb of Mary. He wasn't sinless because of her. She was forgiven because of him. God, my Savior. Rather than proud, she becomes a model of humility for you and for me. You and I, we have been blessed by her son with blessings that could easily fill us also with pride. He made us his brothers and sisters through the waters of baptism. He adopted us as sons and daughters, brought us into the divine family of God, has given us the promise of sharing in his everlasting kingdom. We have a place that is set at the table on the day of that great feast in heaven. And a guarantee, even this morning again, where he feeds us with his body and blood. It would be wrong for us to look at all the blessings the Lord has given to us and conclude, I must be special then, mustn't I? Instead, Mary, the mother of our Lord, Look at that great size of the gift that is given. And we shake our heads in astonishment and awe that he would do this for the likes of us. The outrageous size of that great gift leads us not to pride, but to humility and to awe. And even to tears. We are so unworthy of such a love how could we ever deserve it? Never in a million years. And yet there it is. Mary invites you and me this morning into her song. She would say to us, he has loved you with an everlasting love. He took on flesh in me. That's how he came to us. Us who could not come to him. He came to bring us mercy because he remembered that promise long ago to Abraham. He came to pour out his blood to blot out all the world's sins. He came to offer his body to the Father so that you and I could have a way back to the home in our Father's house. He came to pour out his Holy Spirit on us 
so that we could be his temple. He came to take everything from our nature and give us everything in his grace, clothing us with garments of salvation, covering us with a robe of righteousness, with his very own perfect, holy, righteous self. Who are we that he should love us so much? But he has. He has. May we glorify him together. For he who is mighty has done great things for us, and holy is his name. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He's the one born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, and the whole time he never forgets. He remembers that promise to crush the devil's head. And on Good Friday, God lifts up his mighty arm and brings his fist down on Jesus instead of sinners, and through it the devil's head is crushed. All the dirt that the devil has on you. All the muck that you have wandered into and wallowed around in and even tried to blame others for it. Jesus didn't forget to do what he promised. We may still at times feel the guilt, but God surely doesn't see it. Because that baby that came from Mary's womb is God my Savior. He took it all away. God has not forgotten his promise. God has not forgotten you either. He remembers his mercy. It never falls short of what you and I need. And where he is with his mercy and forgiveness, there he also is with his love to carry you through this world of sin and sorrow to himself in heaven. He's the Savior, but not just the Savior. He is your Savior. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in faith through Christ Jesus. Amen. If you turn to page 8 in your worship folder, let us now join in singing our confession of faith in our gracious, loving, triune God as our offering is brought forward.
Before we join with the response of Advent prayer, we join in a prayer of thanks and praise with Bev Corchi as she celebrates her 85th birthday. Lord of love, we thank you for the 85 years of grace you've granted to your servant, Bev Corchi. We praise you for being with her in good days and evil, in joy and sorrow, in sickness and health. We praise you above all for having provided her with the rich comfort of your word and sacraments. Continue to make these treasures her joy and delight. Be her strength even when earthly strength fails. And finally bring her and all of us to the joy and glory of eternal life in your presence. Amen. During this Advent season, we lift up our prayers to you, O Lord. As you have promised, please answer our prayers according to your perfect wisdom. Give us extra patience and trust in your love and grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Through the power and truth of your word, lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. As your Old Testament people waited eagerly for the first advent of the Savior. Lead us by your Holy Spirit to an understanding of our sinfulness and our need for repentance. Be our strength in the hour of temptation and help us to serve you by bringing glory to your name. Grant your abiding peace to all who are gathered around your gospel here today. May all our decisions, words, and actions be reflections of hearts that are truly thankful for your great mercy. We ask for all these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Savior Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Would you please stand? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
rejoice in the Lord always. God is at hand. Joy and gladness for all who seek the Lord. Please stand. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you to true faith and to life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace, filled in the joy of forgiveness that is yours in your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Behold, he who was to come has come. We welcome him with thankful hearts. Behold, he who has come is coming again. We wait for him with fervent faith. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Receive with rejoicing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in our closing hymn number 30, Arise, Shine. Amen.